So we're gonna start our session, kind of relax a little bit and really get the room liberated. So we'll start using our Ting Sha bells. Okay, does everyone feel liberated? <laughs> So we'll begin, <laughs> it's that easy. So today we're gonna be talking about creating more substance in classrooms, these connections and ideas. So we also are talking about liberating conventional structures that you typically see in a classroom setting or in an academic setting. Okay, does anyone have the PowerPoint clicker? Oh, I have it, okay. And then, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, just note that we will probably have to adapt number three just to make sure that everyone has a, t a chance to speak. So we're gonna start with impromptu networking, one, two, three, four, all, 15 solutions paired with Troika Consulting and using our talking stick as a debrief. And then Hannah Murley, who is a, a PhD student in prevention science, will be leading the debrief on that. And just for a little more context, we're gonna be going very quickly through some activities that we feel you can use in the classroom. It's a selection out of a, a, a larger group of activities that you can use, or in meetings. Usually in um, the classroom or in meetings, we have structures that are either very tight with one person lecturing or presenting and everybody sitting and listening and falling asleep, or too loose, very loose, where you ask a question, um, and one or two or three or four people who tend to dominate conversations jump in, and some people never ever speak. Uh, liberating structures um, are liberating because they set people free um, to speak at the level that they're comfortable in smaller groups and in some kind of structure um, that lets people who are pretty introverted participate fully and easily. And um, what these structures do is really amazing in, in a classroom or a meeting. I've seen it with my own eyes several times. Um, I used liberating structures to set up a group project in a course that I was teaching last year. And it's the first time in 12 years of teaching that course that I did not have people complaining to me about who was doing what work and why am I with this person and so on. So they're really very powerful. So there are, generally speaking, uh, sort of five primary ways that we arrange conversations and, and group settings. Uh, and those are over here on the left, they're all red. And you can see that sort of on a continuum in terms of how the control is distributed and which amount of people are involved in sort of shaping what happens in the classroom environment, uh, all of these fall where one person is generally the, the person in control, right? That, that would be the instructor. And then the amount of, or, or one person is really involved in what happens. And then the, the control varies. An open discussion tends to be pretty free form, can sort of go anywhere. Uh, one person is trying to help facilitate it, but it, it's a little, you know, it can be a bit risky. The brainstorm is similar. Um, the presentation, of course, being on the far bottom left, right? One person very controlled, they know exactly, they have a PowerPoint, they know exactly what's gonna happen, and it, and it goes from there. Liberating structures really try to shift, it's not on, perfect. <laughs> awesome. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah. No problem. Like I said, complete out of control. <laughs> uh, that's what we're trying to do with liberating structures, right? This is, uh, it's, I'm kidding. Okay, so, um, Liberating Structures tries to involve more people in the determination of sort of where we go with the, the conversation and, uh, and sort of shares that wealth and, and gets people involved more regularly throughout. So really briefly, this is one way of sort of dividing up and we're not gonna go over all of these. We're only gonna introduce you to three or four today, um, but, but you can actually use the different liberating structures for different purposes within a classroom setting. So a number of them fall into what we might consider sort of the networking category, right? Things that get people interacting with more multiple people. Another would be the sort of get and give help, get people uh, sharing ideas and, and listening to others and, and uh, generating things together. And then novelty experience, sort of uh, creating new ideas and, and new ways of approaching challenging situations that they face. And we'll try to introduce you briefly uh, to a couple of examples within those categories. Okay. 
the advantages of liberating structures are that they're very simple. Um, they only require a few minutes to set up. You don't need to be an expert. Any of you can walk away and uh, you know do these, look at the website and do them on your own. Um, they generate better than expected innovative results. Really great ideas come from this. Um, they're rapid cycling, um, and they're not probably quite as rapid as we're talking right now, but we're talking fast because we want to get to the actual activities. They include everybody. Um, they work for all kinds of small problems or big problems, like major projects. Um, they're really fun, and they're easy to cop copy without any kind of formal training. Um, so many of you are here today because you want to know, how do I liberate the classroom? This information is great and all, but how do I transcend that information to my students? How do I make the classroom more liberating? Uh, just a different format. So Arvind Singal from the University of Texas at El Paso has been using, using liberating structures for the past like six years, and he's noticed a shift in how the students react to his presentations. And he said the hardest part about teaching was letting go and learning how to give control to everyone else. And I think that as a teacher, a lot of times we forget how to let go and give control to the class. So the best part and the easiest way to do that is physically moving students around. Now some of the classrooms at WSU, uh, the chairs are in place, you can't really move them. So you kind of have to adapt that situation. This summer, uh, I was in a classroom where the chairs were in place and I couldn't move them. So I took the class outside. It was a lot more fun for the students, they were a lot more engaged and, and they had a good time. But physically moving the students from the traditional rows and columns into a circular seating arrangement really makes the difference. It allows everyone to be equally seen, heard, and acknowledged. So you take, in, in, in traditional classrooms, you see those people at the beginning who either sit in the front row or the back row. This gets rid of that situation and allows everyone to have an opportunity to talk. Uh, next, we will introduce the talking stick. And Hannah has our talking stick for today because that is how we're going to be your little pen. So our talking stick today, this is how we're going to be doing our debrief. You can use a pen or a pencil, but every time, anytime you're doing small group work, you have a, one person who's asserting control in the situation. You want to get rid of that. So you want to make sure that this talking stick serves as whoever's holding the stick is the only person who can talk during that time. You have to listen. Everyone else has to listen. And we like to refer to this as leading through listening. Um, continuing with that, learning to let it go. As Arvin says, it's often the hardest part. We've worked so hard to get our PhDs and now we want to be in control of the classroom. But in order to control, sometimes you have to give others the, the stage. So you have to liber liberate yourself from bearing the sole burden of professing in the classroom. Be mi mindful of positionality. So when you go to a classroom, often you are sitting behind a podium with a little PowerPoint clicker. Your position in the class will often dictate how people interact with you. Um, when you are in a circular pattern, everyone is in the spotlight. So you're, taking, you're being mindful of that positionality. So what is it we need to do? We need to shift the focus as the professor being, what is it I need to do to what is it that the class needs to do? And then lastly, from professor to chief enabler. So you're enabling a safe and a comfortable environment where everyone has a chance to participate and be involved in the process. Okay, so this leads us to our first activity. I want everyone to get up and move your chairs back if you can. So, I want you guys to pair up with someone that you don't know in this room, and you will share with this person. These are the two questions I want you to think about. What is a small risk you have taken to progress on a big challenge? It could be any big challenge. It could be related to school, you teaching, meetings, anything. And what do you hope to get and contribute from this gathering? Okay. So, um, once I ring the bell, you'll meet with your first partner and kind of go across the room. Just don't go to the person next to you. And, um, <laughs> shared this big challenge that you've, you've had and then uh, what do you hope to contribute to this gathering, okay? And, and, sorry, sorry, I was just gonna chime in. And very briefly, one of the things we wanna make sure you understand as we do this together is that you can fit this into a classroom setting, but it takes, for putting that out there, that it needs to be brief sharing and then we'll, we'll move quickly when you hear the tingsha bells, mm -hmm. it'll be to move again. Uh, share and get to know folks in a, in a brief fashion. 
And if somebody ends up without a partner, just raise your hand and right. one of us will And one jump. of us will jump in. Um, this is something that you can replace with the traditional classroom icebreakers that you do at the beginning of class where you say, what's your name, what's your major? It really isolates people. Now, if you did a impromptu networking at the beginning of a class, you can use the same type of questions, but everyone's going to communicate and really get to know each other a lot better. Okay, so when I ring the ting shop bells, pair up with someone you don't know and uh, talk about these questions. Each person will have one minute to do this. Do you want me to not have to participate in their event in order to do the timing? Um, I think. I think that might be easiest. It might be easiest. Yeah. And do you want me to be the tincture bells? Um, no, it's okay. And we can okay. do unless you for the debrief. I think you should. Okay. I'm excited. This is fun. Yeah. It's really exciting. Then. person speak. Okay. <laughs> if, you, if you've already done that, that's okay, then you can continue talking, but usually one person speaking, the other person is listening, so that's key. Okay, so. And. Start with one person um, discussing the prompt, and then the next person's just going to listening until we ring the bell, and then you uh, you switch with each other. Okay. So switch. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to brief this at all before we move on? Brief 
Well, why we use... You know what I'm saying? You want to be this. this. to do it really fast but that's something that you can do in a classroom setting so typically we do three rounds of this and uh, this is a rapid version so you would spend more time with each person and then also you'd have a debriefing period to find out like common themes and stuff but we're gonna make this pretty fast so we're not gonna do our third round we're gonna go straight to our next activity which is one two four all and Joe is gonna be leading that uh, one, two, four, all. This is something, by the way, and, and impromptu networking as well, and this one, I, I use these in very, uh, very different classroom settings. I'll use these in lecture halls with uh, over 150 students, and I'll use this same process in a smaller group of 10 to 20 students. So uh, very flexible, can be used in a, oh, right, sorry. Not doing so well with the microphone thing. So again, can be used in very small group settings and large uh, equally well. So uh, very flexible in that way. Here's the way it works. Really simple. One, two, four, all. One is just you individually thinking about the prompt for about a minute. Two, you pair up with one other person and share about that prompt. Four then moves where your pair, the two of you, pair up with another pair, and that makes a little group of four. And then all is where we bring it back out and some of those groups share out some of what they heard and, and we may ask some specific prompts about those individual group settings. Um, I'll, I'll briefly sort of make a comment as we move from each one to the next, but we're gonna start by simply finding a pair. So find somebody new that you haven't met with already and you're going to, uh, in this first one, share a story. And, and so first think about it for about a minute. And then you're going to share a story about how you successfully handled a difficult classroom challenge. And this is going to move quickly again. So think about it for about a minute and think also sort of like how would I, how would I convey that in about a minute to someone else. Okay, so think for a moment about a story of how you successfully handled a difficult classroom challenge. Do you want to start the And by the way, if that moment felt especially long to you, you may be an extrovert. And it is important to keep in mind as an instructor that we do have uh, folks who, who approach every situation a little bit differently. And it's really key to give some time, uh, particularly for those who are a little more introverted, um, to think through these things before we move on. So let's go ahead and find someone that you, have not, that you do not know and haven't talked with already today. And you'll share in uh, partners, in pairs. And you'll do just one minute for each and listen for the Tinksha Bell for when to switch. Go ahead. Although I love the I love the teacher that is. Sure, we can, yeah, one minute, so, go ahead, I, yeah. Okay. All right, so go ahead and switch. If the other person hasn't begun sharing yet, switch, and make sure each have a chance to share their story.
All right, go ahead and wind up that second, uh, that second individual sharing. What we're going to do now is those pairs are going to find another pair, and so you'll find two other folks. As we do that, in the next round, what's going to happen is, rather than sharing the story that you shared, you are going to share the story that you heard. So you'll go into that other pair, and you'll share about what your partner told you, and the other Folks will do the same. We'll get all four of the individuals sharing what they heard from their partners. You'll get four good uh, examples of ways that folks have dealt with challenging situations in the classroom, and you'll uh, have an opportunity to sort of practice that good active listening that, that you just did a few minutes ago and, and your chance to sort of articulate that. And, and if you shared it, your chance to sort of hear what that sounded like uh, to someone else who has, who has heard what you shared. So at the Tinksha Bells, and what I'll do this time is uh, we'll go ahead and have one pair share, you know, so one person share what they heard and the other person share what they heard, and maybe we'll just ring it uh, at the midway point, so rather than each time, uh, so you'll know to, to make sure to get through all four of them. Does that make sense? And we'll have about three minutes to do this. So at the Bells, go ahead and find a, another pair. Come on over if you guys need. So that bell. that bell just indicates that you should be through about two and, and get to the other two at this point. So keep sharing. Uh, we've got about another minute and a half. but it'll give them a sense of it. And 
I may, um, I may ring my own this time. All right, so let's wrap up that bit of sharing with your group. So the next stage here would be to sort of bring out, and we'll do this quickly, maybe just one group share. We, we would normally spend a little bit of time sort of um, drawing out some of what came in these different groups. A uh, number of different ways to do that. You can ask for what some common themes you heard were across all four uh, sharings. You can look for divergences, what, what, what things were different as you listen to the different people sharing. Right now, uh, maybe if we could just share one or two groups, what's one idea that came out in those uh, group settings that you found significant and that stood out in those conversations? Would anyone like to share? Um, okay. So one idea that stood out to me that the three of us or the four of us, we went through challenges, but it sounded like each of us took the challenge individually because they, I feel like, I feel they were responsible. Like they just didn't want to quit. So each of them had to go, to go through a challenge, but then they took it on themselves to solve it and to perform it better what we what somebody could expect like they came up with solutions yeah. very good so so it seemed to you that in those sharings uh folks took responsibility took ownership and didn't didn't sort of place blame for the challenge that was that was taking place very good maybe one more briefly this is where the real the real real meat of liberating structures is, right? Turning the turning the power over to you. Share out. Um, maybe one more. Over here, anyone? Anything folks noticed? Um, this one's from from my partner who I talked to at the beginning. We were talking about how um, every once in a while you hit technology snags in, in a given classroom, and that's something that we all all related to, um, and how you can turn that into an opportunity um, that actually re-engages students by having them think about what they're doing with the technology. In this case, talking about something like research and internet searches. Um, you can do that same sort of conversation with the whiteboard, getting people re-engaged um, re with the topic, um, even if, for example, the internet's not working at that particular moment. Very good. Thank you. And, and again, if we had more time, I would love to hear from each group individually, but we'll move on to the next activity. Thank you. All right, next we're going to string together two different activities. The one is called 15% Solution, and the second one is called Troika. Um, for the 15% Solution, what we will have everybody do is think for, for a minute um, about the invitation that I will give you. And in Liberating Structures, instead of calling these prompts, we call them invitations. And the structuring of the invitation, what you invite people to do, is probably where a lot of the art of Liberating Structures comes in, especially in the classroom. So you can translate in your own head to actual content area kinds of invitations or project invitations, project relevant invitations that you might give to students. In this case, We'll just ask you, and it's nice following on the, the theme that came out of your group, um, is to think of some kind of barrier or challenge in the way that you currently, in a classroom that you currently have, that would make it difficult, or that you've had recently, that would make it difficult to implement these liberating structures in your classroom. Um, I can always think of eight, new, eight reasons why I, can't, I shouldn't be doing something new. So I'm inviting you to think about those <laughs> challenges. Um, and then take a minute to think about one small step that you can do to deal with this challenge. And it should be a you know, pretty substantial challenge if you can come up with one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll give you um, 
Yeah, so you have one minute to think about it, just like Joe was saying in the past activity, one minute to really reflect of what this challenge is of implementing liberating structures in the classroom. And then you have to also think of that, that little sliver, that 15% solution, that tiny thing that you can do to address that challenge that you might face. So you have one minute to talk about that, or to think about that, and then um, you have one minute per person to share your biggest challenge. So um, you're gonna get into groups of three after you, you kind of reflect your challenge, and then we'll do the next step once you get into your group of three. The, the first step you mean? Or? Yeah, that's the first step. Okay. No, we, we want you to, to mix around. So the whole point is that everyone is talking to, to different people, and you want to do that in a classroom, too. In classrooms, people tend to congregate towards the same people that they talk to, and that's probably the biggest problem I face. And then often people feel isolated. So you're going to try to switch it around, move with someone that you haven't talked to, and it, you might have talked to everyone, but if you haven't, try to get three people you have not, or two people you have not talked to. Okay. After they do the individual thing, that's what I'm, I'm going Right, after they... Okay, so one minute just on your own, right. and then you get into the threes when the bell rings. And this activity can also be done sitting down, too. Uh, I think for this, pers per this uh, activity itself, we'll just continue to stand up. But if you're in a classroom, you can have people sitting down. So once I ring this bell, you're going to get into groups of three. Now, each person will have one minute to discuss their challenge. And, and um, so the first person will share. And we call this, in Troika Consulting, you have a client and you have a consultant. There's gonna be two consultants in there since you're meeting in groups of three. The client is the person who is speaking. They have one minute to discuss the challenge and their little sliver, their 15% solution. And then also they're going to be inviting the uh, consultants and asking them for help. So one person um, in that group will have one minute to discuss and then after that one minute, that client is gonna turn around and have their back face to the other two. The other two consultants are going to communicate with each other, not talking to the client. They're going to communicate with each other, discussing what that person could possibly do, giving their little tidbit, their little advice to them. Okay, and the client is just supposed to listen. They're not saying anything back, they're just listening, taking that input. Okay, so once I ring the bell, you're going to get into groups of three, and only one person will be discussing the challenge and solution.
I'm gonna explain one more time because this is usually the most challenging people don't understand the concept. And a great question came up right now. What is the point of turning around? A lot of times as uh, professionals, as teachers, as, grad as graduate students, we ask people for advice in situations. And a lot of time we are facing the person and we're very critical of what they have to say. Sometimes we're not really listening. We're quick to you know, bounce off of that and start talking. Turning around takes us away from the situation and allows us just to listen to what the consultants are saying. You cannot see their faces, you cannot really, you just are paying attention and listening. And sometimes that's the hardest part. This is a process of letting go as well and kind of taking the control off of yourself and just actually being liberated, having someone else tell you what to do, give you some advice. So this really helps with that process. So the person who, the client who just talked, you're gonna turn around, but I think Laura has something else to say. Uh, metaphorically, your consultants have your back. That's mm -hmm. another way yeah. to look at this, all right? They're, you're, not, they're not, you're not being rude. These people have your back. And another key to making this really effective is as consultants, uh, take advantage of that opportunity to be creative, uh, bounce ideas off of each other. Uh, don't worry too much about constraints. We do plenty of that already. Uh, just, be, be, you know, it doesn't matter if it's gonna work or not. Just explore ideas and, and that often generates something for the person listening that, may not have, that they may not have come to on their own. And this is where it's so valuable for individuals. So that the client, if you can turn around with your back face to the consultants and the consultants are gonna be talking to each other. Okay, guys, if, if you didn't get an opportunity to turn around, sorry, let me. It always helps when the Tingshaw bells are active. 
If you didn't have an opportunity, the, the client, if you didn't have an opportunity to turn around, make sure you do this, kind of uh, give feedback on the information that you got, and also thank your consultants because they had your back in the process. Okay, so I'll give you about a minute to do this. <laughs> and if you've already done that, then you're free to, to discuss more. <laughs> Okay, hold on. I don't think everyone heard me over there. <laughs> Dave, can you give Hannah your thing? So we're going to do a, a debrief right now. Hannah's going to lead us in the debrief, and I'm holding the talking stick. So if you want to, if you want to respond to um, Hannah's questions, just raise your hand, and I'll come to you with the with the mic. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do now is pass around a talking stick, and the idea here is to eliminate people cutting other people off and really just focus on one person. We're gonna share what we learned today and how we would maybe incorporate this into our classroom. Do you have, where did the talking stick oh, go? Here, right oh, yeah, so okay. So make sure that you speak in the microphone because our live streaming audience would like to hear everything that you have to say. Okay, so who would like to go first? Fantastic. I'd also be curious to hear what this was like. Yeah. It was this like. exercise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it was fun while well, meeting everybody. It's a great idea for a party, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> well, my my team of consultants helped me with uh, the physical structure of my classrooms. Um, I have actually a kind of a liberating structure right now, where it's in th um, circles, in in pods, which is great for what I'm <clears throat> trying to do. But next semester, I have it with stripes down the middle, and they're looking at the wall, and they're not gonna even looking at me, and now how am I gonna, and that, that's bolted down. So how am I gonna deal with that? So they've given me some good ideas about how to turn the students around and face each other, so, and have me walk around more so that I can kind of use some of the principles we're talking about. Okay. Um, should we just pass the mic, and anybody who wants to yeah. speak can speak? That sounds good. Well, thank you guys. <laughs> but I've learned a lot today about how and to use some of these uh, tasks and principles to really get my students uh, more engaged, especially when, as I said, desks are bolted down in a row to actually have them uh, be more engaging. I think I really like the one, two, three, four, all. I think that's a really efficient way of getting things out instead of just going all over the place. I'm really interested in investigating these 33 mo modalities because um, I tend to be a little bit too talky, talky, sage on the stage, and that's really stupid for the stuff that I talk about, that you know, that I teach about in the library. So I'm really interested in kind of investigating some of these options and playing around with them and seeing what works and what doesn't. I think it's really interesting to liberate, you know, let go of being the teacher, being the one in the front of the classroom. I like to engage students, and we're moving into a situation where we need to really engage students. So this has been a great opportunity for me. Thanks. Uh, personally, the experience of just giving my back to my consultants was an interesting thing and helped me really uh, listen effectively and just 
be in be in the mood to just be really focused so i don't know might carry that for the future to use it more i also wanted to comment on the turning your back motion because that, that to me seems like a really interesting um, example of how shifting yourself physically can shift our perspective mentally and uh, help us well, liberate us right from certain ways of thinking, and so I'm really I'm anxious to try that, and not even not even just in the classroom, but in other settings. Um, I've really enjoyed the idea of breaking discussion into these smaller amounts of time. In my class, I have a lot of trouble with uh, some groups that will just go off on a tangent and talk for a ton of time and won't even you know bother when I tell them to stop. And I have other groups who will talk for about 30 seconds and then just sit there looking at their phones, like they've obviously discussed everything. Um, being able to segment things out, I think, would help a lot. I'm interested in thinking about some of these ideas with uh, faculty development opportunities and realizing that I only, the faculty who I work with, I only see a couple times a year, and often I sort of feel like I have to use all that time to impart information, and that probably is not the best use of that time. So much as faculty sort of think, oh, I have all this content, I don't have time for this discussion, sort of rethinking how faculty development opportunities work. I use this for our um, eight hours in a row, liberating structures at our annual faculty retreat. Out of 30 people, 23 of them either came up to me or emailed me later thanking me for this meeting. And I have never in my life been thanked for, um, <laughs> for a meeting. Usually, you know, if anything, the opposite. So it's very effective in, in that way. I enjoyed hearing um, the, different, the diversity of the people that I talked with. Um, I, my training experience is with um, employees, training them on procedure, really long and laborious and audited procedures. And I can, I can see a 15% solution to a, you know, breaking up that two-hour class with an interactive activity um, like some of you have described. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, I th <coughs> Excuse me. I think I could try this. Um, the challenge for me is the next thing to do, though, is coming up with great ideas for the invitation. Because if it's a general thing or they think it's not related to the class, I think they won't take it seriously. So that's, as instructor, the, probably the number one thing. I appreciate learning the one, two, three, four and the talking stick uh, as a way to kind of help with training and also with meetings uh, that I get involved in. And again, hearing the diversity of experiences we have here. Um, I'd really like to learn more about the 33 uh, options. I try to bring humor into whatever I'm doing and sometimes it doesn't go over very well. Um, and I want to thank my consultants because they did give me some good ideas that I can actually use now. So. Well, I don't get up in front of a classroom every day, uh, but this is definitely something I could see, you know, using throughout my professional development as well as in my personal life. So I found it really enlightening. Um, I personally found the idea that you actually have to stop and uh, think about a problem by yourself before actually talking to others to be very interesting. A uh, total minute was actually a very, very, very long time. Uh, and I don't think I have probably tried to do that before. You always just ask students to talk to each other immediately. And I think that's kind of helped uh, make the discussion a lot more productive. So. I think this is a very good idea. Although you said it is very effective, I, a fact we can try this later. I, but uh, it's good for students. Maybe the, the instructors need to prepare more and do a lot of homework before going to the classroom. I think it's, it's better to students. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I agree with just about everything that's been said. Um, certainly, I'm interested to learn. Uh, more about the other 33. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, just kind of thinking about ways of, kind of as was said, sort of breaking up discussions um, to kind of give folks more guidance on how to use up the time that you give to them so they're not just sort of talking for one minute and, and then just kind of spacing out the rest of the couple minutes. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I appreciate the, the information. 
we are wrapping up. So m multiple people mentioned uh, wanting access to those other resources. We do have some uh, resources available for you. And uh, there's also some great resources online. And we can uh, share that with you where you can actually see all of the different liberating structures and get uh, detailed instructions about how to, how to utilize them. So one is all the three, uh, 33 liberating structures that they have uh, out there, and also the website that you can go to, because if you click on the actual liberating structure, it'll tell you instructions on how to do it and how, like when to perform it. And then also they have this wonderful book that is on Amazon, and it is amazing. Uh, it's the surprising power of liberating structure. I definitely recommend if you like it, you should. I'll buy it for the library. Yes. All, right. all right. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much, and I'm going to end with the Ting Shaw Bell. Thank you.